Hello and welcome to another video on the best games of a letter, Arcade Edition. And this is for the letter F. Now in this series I imagine what if I could only choose 5 games per letter per system and discard all others. What would I choose? Now consequently I'm coming from the point of view not what are the games most important to video game history or even which games are most loved. But instead these are the games that I personally enjoy the most to play. Now my choices may surprise you but this video series is really just a bit of fun to help give people suggestions on what games to try the next time you're looking through those fully loaded retro gaming lists and deciding what to play. Okay, as I mentioned, this is for the arcades and the letter F, so without further ado, let us begin. Right, for my number 5 choice, I've gone for the little known arcade game, F-Zero AX. Yes, that's right, in 2003, Nintendo and Sega worked together to update the futuristic racer for the arcade. This was a stuff made of my dreams, a Sega development house, amusement vision, and the people behind games like Daytona and Super Monkey Ball working on such a prestigious Nintendo property. And what we have here is simply gorgeous, with sumptuous graphics, eye-melting speeds, and ridiculous number of other racers all across beautiful and imaginative tracks. This was built on the Triforce arcade system, which was a collaboration at this time between Nintendo, Sega and Namco to do a single arcade board that was easy to use and convert onto. And as you can see here, it really is a powerful arcade board and essentially being a GameCube console of which it's based. Now, along with the blistering visuals and great audio, there's many little nods to Nintendo's past here in the game. There's a giant ROB robot from Nintendo stacking items in the background on Port Town. There's other racer nods as well, such as the racer Mr. EAD, who looks a lot like Mario. And of course, EAD is the Shigeru Miyamoto development studio at Nintendo known as the Entertainment Analysis and Development Division. There's also another racer called James McLeod who is clearly inspired by Fox McLeod in the Star Fox series and his actual car racer that he races around looks strangely like an R-Wing as well. I love all these little touches and nods and these two great champions of my gaming past coming together of Sega and Nintendo to produce this amazing game. Now the, the game itself in the arcades came in three cabinet designs. There was a standard sit-down, the deluxe which is more shaped like a racer cockpit and the ultimate monster ride with full-on moving action. As you can see in the video this game is simply beautiful so why is it not higher on my list? Well the arcade machine is a little bare bones with only a few tracks on it as standard and when you play the GameCube home version called F-Zero GX it gives you so much more to enjoy especially by using a GameCube memory card you can unlock even more tracks between the arcade machine and this. It's a real shame though that the tracks are so limited in the arcade as I think they would have had a real take up if they extended and expanded the tracks like Sega did with OutRun 2 and I think this could have gone on to be a real hit in the arcades. Sadly today the game in the arcade is really rare to come across. Still for those wanting to play this arcade game and thankfully it's fully playable as an unlockable on the Nintendo GameCube console. Now to do so you have to become first in all modes. If however you like me you're not possessing godlike gaming skills then thankfully there's also an action replay code that unlocks the the arcade version in the game. So grab yourself the game with an action replay or indeed the Dolphin emulator which actually has action replay function built into it and play this amazing game today. You won't be disappointed, it truly is a stunning game. Okay, now we come on to my fourth game, and I think my choice here may surprise you. In the end, I went for the Fast and Furious game, 
To be honest, I think I enjoy it so much, as in the modern gaming world, it's nice to see an all-out arcade racer being championed by companies like Raw Thrills, even if the home consoles have sadly given up on them. And I suppose that's increased my love for the game, knowing that arcade racers are so rare today. The game was made in 2004, and this is based on the Cruising series in all but name, with them instead using a film license of The Fast and the Furious to increase recognition. Like those games, it's all about toy box physics, all out fun as you race around several interesting locations across America. Everything is destructible and fast as you use your nitros and pimp out your ride, making it through to the end. Now this was the second game released for Eugene Jarvis's Raw Thrills company, and it really put the arcade manufacturer on the map, bringing it in line with such great arcade manufacturers as Sega and Namco. The game had a generous 12 tracks to race on here, taking you from Hollywood, New York, San Francisco and Arizona to name but a few. And each of these courses have so much going on as well, with one minute you're riding through Chinatown with beautiful neon lights everywhere, or taking a shortcut across the beach of Malibu to gain an advantage on your other racers. And this is what I adore with the game, there's so many hidden paths to learn, so much over the top racing action to enjoy, that I think it can't help but win even the most hardened gaming heart. Now, unfortunately, outside of the Nintendo Wii port, which is called Cruising for this game, and that suffers a lot of slowdown, there isn't any home ports here, which is a real shame, and another reason why Raw Thrills racing compilation is needed in all of our lives. Still, after much sweat and tears, you can kind of get it working on Techno Parrot emulator on a modern TV at the correct full HD resolution, though despite my best efforts, I can't get the control just right as in the arcade and that's a reason for my terrible driving here being more rubbish than usual so that's my excuse anyway why I'm so bad at playing this game in the video Okay, so next we come to my third favourite game, and I've decided to choose Fantasy Zone by Sega, released in 1986. In the game, you play Opa Opa, a cute game craft that pits you against an array of equally cute enemies. The game is deceptively simple here. You fly Opa Opa around the levels, shooting the enemy bases. These enemy bases are constantly generating enemies as well, so it's important you shoot them down quickly. Flying around across the map or towards these locations, you must take them all out, and once all bases are destroyed, you can move on to the next area. Each enemy or base you shoot also drops coins, which if you dive quickly enough and pick up the bouncing coins before they disappear, will give you increased cash. This can be used in a shop that randomly appears, depicted by a, under a red balloon in the level, and this allows you to spend all that hard-earned money for things like extra lives, weaponry, or making you temporarily fast all helping you progress in the level. You then come up against some really hard enemy bosses at the end of certain levels as well. And this is why I love the game. It's vibrant colours, it's amazingly cute, but it's devious and extremely tough gameplay that surprises a lot to play it thinking it's perhaps quite kid-like. This was done by the same fevered minds that brought us Flicky, and it's all cast to a suite of catchy tunes from the music maestro himself, Hiroshi Miyayuchi, yes he of Outrun, Afterburn and Music fame. Now Opa Opa became one of Sega's early mascots, even turning up in the Japanese anime TV show called Zillion. Yes, the same Zillion of which there's that brilliant Master System game. And also, that's what the Zapper gun was based on, on the Sega Master System that's based from that anime cartoon. It's so easy to see why Opa Opa became so beloved as well. Each time he lands and his little legs come out to run, to his flight animations, it's just bursting with cuteness and fun, but I just can't get enough of it. Now these days, thankfully, there is many ways the game can be played today. Now outside of the original impressive port of the Master System, this also found its way on the NES, the Sharp X68000 and the TurboGrafx-16, which are all pretty good ports. Later, it was seen on the Japanese-only Sega Ages series on the Sega Saturn. Even better was on the PS2, which had the Fantasy Zone complete collection, with six, count them, six games in the series. This also included the improved version of Fantasy Zone 2 that had 
even better graphics than the arcade original. And it's also got the brilliant Mega Drive Super Fantasy Zone, which is a game that needs to be played by more. Now these days, the game appears on the Hidden Unlockable Extra on the Sega Mega Drive Ultimate collection on the Xbox 360 and PS3 era, um, but probably the best way to play it is on the 3DS, which had a wonderful port of the game, where not only is it solidly made, but it also has the 3D element, letting you see all those vibrant colours popping out at you in true 3D. As I mentioned, overall this is a deceptively tough game, and that is often dismissed by shooter aficionados who are put off quite frankly by its cuteness but trust me this is a solid and tough blaster and well worth giving it a go today right on to my number two choice and i've gone for the capcom scrolling beat-em-up classic final fight released in 1989 this game was a revelation in its release taking all that was great about double dragon but giving large updated sprites sumptuous graphics and gorgeous locales all against a range of madcap enemies to thwart. Now playing one or two of three characters, you must kick, punch and body slam your enemies to take on the mad gear gang, who's kidnapped one of the playable player's daughter. Jessica. You see, Hagar is an ex-wrestler who's recently become mayor, and he also, strangely, bears a striking similarity to the wrestler and commentator for WWF, Jesse Ventura. Now, he's backed up by his friends Guy and Cody, who set off to take on the gang, clean up the town, and rescue his daughter. It's all across six distinct levels, and there's some really memorable bosses to defeat as well. Now, originally, this game was billed as Street Fighter 89, but it was seen to be a sequel to that game, but rather sensibly, Capcom decided to keep the genre separate and instead give the game its own distinct name, hence the term Final Fight. And that's really all about it with the game. I adore this game, I love the weapons like the drain pipe that you can use. It looks amazing, it plays amazing. I love the varied enemies such as the Andre the Giant and all with their own distinct personalities. It's a game that just screams fun with a capital F and N. Now back in the day the home ports were pretty lacklustre, even if on the Amiga I still convinced myself it's a pretty good port. Thankfully the Mega CD version of the game more than made up for it being the definitive way to play the game back in the day, even though it was a good few years on from the arcade initial release. Now thankfully years later in 2006 the game also arrived on the Capcom Classic compilation on the PS2, Xbox and PSP era and that did a really solid job. It also found its way onto the Xbox 360 Double Impact Pack as well, which is another great one to play it. But on the modern consoles, there's no real way to play it outside of MAME and a PC, which is a real shame. But thankfully, as you can see here, MAME does a great job, but hopefully this will find its way onto another way onto the modern consoles soon. Right, okay, that brings me on to my number one game for the letter F in the arcades, and I've chosen Food Fight, released in 1983 by Atari and developed by GCC, who of course brought the world Miss Pac-Man. Now the game is simplicity itself, with you playing Charlie Chuck, a boy with a big appetite and a love for ice cream. Therefore you must run across the screen, dodging the chefs and pits strewn around to make it to that ice cream before it melts. To aid you in achieving this, there's food strewn around, which can be picked up and hurled at the chefs, temporarily taking them out of the action and giving you a score. The trouble is, likewise, those dastardly chefs can do the same to you, picking up food and hurling it towards you and losing a life, with all the food in addition hurled at you for that final humiliation. As you probably can tell, I adore this game. There's a real strategy actually to how you take each level, and all the chefs have their own distinct personalities, which I love. But along with the stonkingly good and addictive gameplay, it's the charm of the whole thing that wins me over. Little touches, such as Charlie's eyes turning in the direction you're about to 
run to that impossibly large mouth of Charlie as he gulps the ice cream whole and has that satisfied, greedy grin on his face after. I just can't stop playing the game, it's just so addictive. Even better in the game, very, very rarely, the game, if the game thinks it was exciting enough with enough near misses, etc, with the food fight, then when you complete the level, it does a replay of the whole entire level that you've just played, all accompanied by its own unique replay jaunty tune. Now I love this cool feature, and I love the fact that it so rarely appears, which means when it does, it really is something special to encounter. And it was mind-blowing to me that in a 1983 there was a game that could replay the whole past level. This is largely in thanks to the fact that this was actually one of the first 16-bit games, amazingly, with only Quantum, also done by GCC, released just pipping it to the post. So that allowed the developer to have additional memory to allow such features like this to play. Now sadly, this game only saw a few home ports released back in the day, but thankfully these machines it was released for were all amazing home ports that really captured the full experience of the arcade. Now the games were the Atari 7800, the Atari 800 and the Atari XEGS consoles and computers, although there was things like um, Mud Pie and Mud Shoot that found its way onto other systems like the Atari ST, but they weren't official ports. Now, these days, the only place to play that Food Fight game is on the Evercade, which has a brilliant version of the 7800 port on the Atari cart. And 2005, there was an Atari Flashback console, one of those sort of plug and play consoles that also had the 7800 port of Food Fight. But unfortunately, if you want the arcade version, there's only really the ill-fated and now completely defunct Xbox 360 game room that released it. Thankfully, MAME, as you can see here, runs it very well, so that is another direction you can go. But really, any of the home ports are missing something, because unfortunately it had a really special controller in the arcade that was analogue and had numerous directions. This means that whilst all the home ports and emulations do an amazing job, and I still love to play it, the only way to really, truly experience the game as it was fully intended is on a real arcade machine. Thankfully, Arcade Club in Bury in the UK have one of these beautiful and rare machines. So it's well worth giving the place a visit and, and giving this game a try. So there you go. There's my top five. And of course, as always, I've had to leave so many firm favourites off my list to whittle it down. But I can't help myself. I'm going to briefly mention some honourable games here. Okay, the first one, is, of course, is Frogger. Released in 1981 and by Konami. It's an amazing game, so full of fun and iconic as you negotiate your hapless frog across the busy street in crocodile infested river to arrive safely home. Now I love this game, but I do find after a few levels I lose interest in it, with it not giving me enough new things to do. Then you have Sega's Flicky, released in 1984, where you must dash around the levels collecting up all the chicks and taking them to the exit before all the nasty cats catch you. It's a huge amount of fun, but again, it's another game that I quickly get bored of after an extended play. Another one worthy of mention is, of course, Fatal Fury, King of Fighters, released by SNK. Now, this introduced such amazing fighters as Terry Bogard, and of course was the beginning of the brilliant King of Fighter series that came for many, many iterations. Now, this fighter is a great, slower pace, more tactical fighter than games like Street Fighter 2, and it really is a worthy rival to Capcom's crown. Another fighter I adore is Sega's 1995 3D fighter called Fighting Viper. This is a great beat-em-up and one that I personally really adore, but it was just my love of arcade racing games that relegated this off the top five list for this letter, if I'm honest. But it's well worth giving this game a go, and especially on the Sega Model 2 emulators can be seen here, which does an amazing job of recreating the arcade original. Likewise, there was another title that just got kicked off my top five list, Forgotten Worlds, released in 1989 by Capcom. This was a really unique horizontal shooter that had, as well as the joystick, a spinner alongside so you could choose a direction 
collection of fire. Now I adore this game, it's so much fun, and even that complexity that I always struggle with of doing the spinner and the joystick at the same time, it's still a blast to play. Now one game that I really want to give an honourable mention to is Final Star Force. Now this is a series that I love, I love the Star Force series, and this third and final game is a firm favourite of mine. Released in 1992 by Techno, this is a criminally forgotten and overlooked game, mostly because it never ever saw a home port anywhere, meaning for many it just passed them by. But if you get a chance, track this down and give this game a go, it's a great continuation of the series. Finally, we have the amazing shooter called Fever SOS by Cave and released in 1998. This mixes in bullet hell shooting with 70s disco. Do you need any more? Well, what you have here is shooting and rescuing the people floating in space as you blast your way through the level. This is a tough, really tough blaster, but it's so much fun. It's definitely one I keep going back to again and again. So there you go. There's my personal top five for the letter F in the arcades. I fondly hope, along with the honourable mentions, it will encourage you to try some of these amazing games again. Likewise, let me know in the comments below your thoughts and what your top five choices would be, as I would love to know. As always, alongside all these videos and the much balancing of retro gaming alongside work and family life, I also do a free retro gaming podcast called RGBS, or the Retro Gaming Discussion Show. It's just me and a few friends discussing all things retro gaming, and we can go into a lot more detail into these games and games like it than I can do here. So look out for my next video where we cover the letter G for the arcades, and this is definitely one that I cannot wait to cover. So until next time, keep it retro.